All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Future of Healthcare event. Uh, my name is Jason, and I'm the Tallow Community Manager. And so I'm here to introduce you to the Future of Healthcare and what this event is all about. So if you don't know Tallow, we'll be introducing Tallow to you very soon. And if you uh, don't know HOSA, you'll also learn to love them very soon as well. But our two organizations partnered together to put on this event uh, and a larger initiative called Healthcare Month that we'll get into in a little bit. But the reason that we did this is both for HOSA and for TALO, healthcare is the number one in-demand industry for our members. And so we decided we really want to double down and create some content together that would really benefit our members. Uh, we know that you all have academic and career goals that are connected to the medical field and healthcare. And so we designed a whole month of healthcare content and opportunities. And the Future of Healthcare event is part of that larger initiative. Uh, so before we get further into Healthcare Month, uh, let's dive into the future of healthcare. And so, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen real quick. All right. So what you can expect today. Uh, so we'll be doing an intro to healthcare month. I'm going to let you know about all the opportunities that there are and how to get involved. Uh, then my colleague, Emily, will give you uh, an overview of how to leverage tallow. So all those academic and career goals that you have in the healthcare field, how you can leverage tallow to find the best internships, scholarships, and opportunities. Uh, we have active talent seekers, uh, professional organizations like HOSA, companies and colleges that are on tallow looking for ambitious talent like you. And so Emily is gonna give you a walkthrough of how to leverage tallow to advance those goals. Uh, then we have a session with our friends at HOSA, so they're going to walk through all the different opportunities that you have there as well, share a little bit of their personal story at HOSA so you can get a glimpse into what that looks like. And finally, we're going to end it all with the Future of Healthcare panel. So we brought together some really amazing industry experts from all different sectors of healthcare that are going to share their thoughts, their expertise on different topics um, around the future of healthcare. And so we're gonna be taking questions from the audience as well. Uh, if you have questions about future of healthcare, what are trends, what are opportunities, put those in the Q&A section, not the chat, uh, but we'll be taking those as the event goes on. So if you start having questions for our panelists about where they see the future of healthcare going, just put those in the Q&A section. Cool. Okay, so we're gonna jump into a quick overview of the Tallow community. So we are hosting uh, this whole healthcare month on the Tallow community. So the Tallow community is a feature of Tallow that allows all of our members to connect with each other and also professionals, uh, industry professionals, companies, organizations, so you can ask your questions and get answers and mentorship uh, on all different sorts of subjects. So career exploration, high school life, higher education, uh, how to pay for school. So I'm gonna give you a quick walkthrough of the Tallow community. I just wanna do a quick check-in. Can everyone see the Tallow community on my screen? Okay. Perfect, thank you. So the Tallow community, uh, we are hosting Healthcare Month on the Tallow community, so you can navigate there by going to the healthcare section. So um, I'm going under career exploration, scrolling down to health science, and you can see some of the opportunities that we have available and that the content that we've been creating for our members that have an interest in the medical field. So HOSA has put up a challenge, a $2,500 scholarship to 
share your host a story. So if you haven't heard all of that already, we're putting the link in the chat. But if you're a member of HOSA, I'd really encourage you to jump in, share your story, and it's a chance at uh, the HOSA scholarship. We're also hosting Ask Me Everythings with uh, industry professionals. So we actually have an Ask Me Everything coming up with Dr. Melissa Shepard. Uh, she's a psychiatrist and a therapist. You can see her profile um, in this post but she's a TikTok influencer. She gives great advice. People reach out to her uh, to talk through how did you get into the field and hear her expertise. So you can log into the community and start asking your questions. She's going to be answering those uh, on October 25th. But you can explore more of what Healthcare Month is on the community, but we have great partners like HOSA uh, and some industry experts. We have uh, different posts highlighting different sectors of healthcare, but this is all content that we put together for you to get more informed on your next steps in your healthcare journey. So I really uh, encourage you to check it out and jump into the TALA community to see more of how you can get involved. But from here, we're going to continue with the future of healthcare event. So I'm going to pass it over to Emily from my team, and she's going to share more about how you can leverage Tallow. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Good evening, depending on where you are coming from. I'm Emily, and I'm so excited to be here today. While I'm getting my screen shared, I'd love to know where are you attending from? Let me know where you're from in the chat. I am from Charleston, South Carolina. Awesome. Got some Florida people representing. Love to see it. Texas, Missouri, Chicago, Georgia, Ohio. I cannot even read these as fast as they're coming in. That is awesome. California, we are coast to coast here. Venezuela, international. I love that. Thank you. Proud New Jersey host a member. Welcome. Thanks so much for coming today. Um, I'm going to really quickly talk about tallow. I know I saw some questions about people that said they were less familiar with tallow, and I know a lot of HOSA students already have tallow profiles, but I'm going to go over some quick updates and um, help you all be able to showcase your best self and connect to some really awesome healthcare opportunities on tallow. So we're going to do a quick introduction, think about our future, and just dive into tallow really quickly for the next five to 10 minutes. So a little bit about me before we get started. Um, I am the director of education at Tallow, which is a fancy way of saying I work with students and student organizations like HOSA and schools every day. And I get to help students um, showcase themselves on Tallow and connect to their dream job, their dream college, scholarships. So I think I have a really cool job. Um, I live in Charleston and I went to the University of South Carolina and studied science education. I actually was a high school physical science and physics teacher for six years. Um, and things I can help with, all things tallow, how to use tallow, how to complete your profile, how to really showcase what makes you unique and connect to opportunities. So if you ever have a question or want to reach out or you're looking for something specific on tallow, um, feel free to connect with me. You can email me directly at teach, like teacher, at tallow.com. And you can see my tallow profile there. But for those of you who are less familiar with tallow, just a really quick recap. Tallow is a free online portfolio system that you can use um, as long as you are 13 or older, but through the rest of your career life. So many of you might be in high school or college, and you're using Tallow to showcase what you are doing uh, while you're in school, as well as your future goals and plans. It grows with you as you grow, so you can continue using it beyond the pathway that you are currently in. Um, you can showcase what you want to do in your future, as well as what you're currently doing to get there. So it's a great way to get organized and show off what you're already doing, whether that's extracurricular, or academic, um, match with scholarships, which I know is top of mind for any student that is looking to continue their education beyond high school, and then get discovered by colleges and companies. And we have a really cool new tool that just launched today that I'm going to show you in just a moment. 
All of you that have signed up for Tallow already have a digital portfolio. If you have not created your Tallow account, all you have to do is go to tallow.com and click the sign up button. From there, you'll answer a few questions and then you will have your portfolio. Inside of your portfolio, you can earn digital badges like the HOSA digital badge. You can showcase your extracurricular activities and hobbies, even show work experience and education, um, and also tell us about your future goals and plans. That helps us connect you with colleges, companies, events like Healthcare Month, and organizations like HOSA. So I'm going to show you a profile really quickly. So this is a uh, demo student on Tallow that's profile is 100% complete. Um, look at the left-hand side, you can see this student's current status. I could actually play a video he's updated on his, uploaded on his profile to showcase that um, he has great communication skills and actually talk to his goals. He even wrote a really nice personal introduction on his bio section and showcased that he's a host member there because colleges and companies are using Palo to connect with students like yourselves that are already getting great health science and healthcare related experiences while you're in high school or college. Along the top, you can see the future goals and plans section. If you already have a Tallow profile, ch check into this section. If you made your profile a few years ago, make sure this still shows the goals you have now. We know plans change, but this is how we match you with opportunities. So we want to make sure that those career interests are relevant to your current goals. Same with what you want to do in your next steps, whether that's going to college, going to graduate school, like medical school, getting a job, getting an internship. And then the rest of the profile is your portfolio. That's where you can earn digital badges. There are HOSA badges um, that the HOSA organization actually promotes for members to showcase their involvement on Palo. You can also showcase your memberships and extracurriculars throughout the portfolio, like in the memberships, extracurricular activities and hobby section. If you have a part-time job or an internship or you get to job shadow at a hospital, for example, those are also great things to put in the work experience responsibility section. We love to see students that showcase their accomplishments. That can be academic, but also extracurricular. If your host a chapter wins an award or you win a scholarship, for example, add that in here. Your Tallow profile is meant to be a work in progress. So I'll keep this updated. I like to tell students to set a reminder and make sure you're coming back every few months, um, if not more often, and checking in, adding in new things about yourselves, because all of this helps us to understand who you are and what your goals are and match you to better opportunities. You can show us classes you've taken, languages you speak, and even upload files that you're proud of, like a project or a letter of recommendation. From there, you can use the dashboard to use our scholarship matching search engine. This might be grayed out for you at the start. You can just click activate in the financial aid section and you can actually match with over $20 billion in scholarships. It takes the information from your Tallow profile, syncs it to Red Kite's network of over $20 billion in scholarships and shows you scholarships you are eligible for that you can apply for today. We have had students earn twenty dollars and $30,000 through Tallow's platform, and actually one student earned $50,000 in one scholarship last year to Drexel, and she was featured on Good Morning America, which was really cool. So you could be that student too. This um, tool has taught me that there is a scholarship out there for everything, and they're just hard to find, but I think this tool makes finding scholarships a lot easier. The last thing I'm going to showcase is just our new jobs and internships feed tool. So a lot of you might be looking for upcoming experiences um, or internships for next semester or this summer. This tool actually launched today. So you are the first students that are getting to see this live with us. We're really excited about that. So from here, you can start your search based on what we know about you in your profile or also search based on location or another job title. And we're going to show you jobs and internships that you might be a great fit for. So we hope you use this new tool and connect to some really awesome opportunities. It's a nationwide search. I agree. This is a really cool tool. Thanks for sharing that in the chat. So just to wrap up really quickly some best practices for your Tallow profile. Like I mentioned before, make sure your future goals and plans section is up to date. This helps us match you with opportunities. So you do want to log in regularly, review your profile every few months, uh, check your notification inbox and make sure your email address that you're using with Tallow is an email you actually check. Um, use the file section to showcase your projects, letters of recommendations and work samples and use the jobs module and the opportunities tab to apply for opportunities and check out the community like Jason showed before. 
And if you ever have any questions, feel free to reach out to me directly. And I'm always happy to help. My email is teach at tallow.com. And thank you so much for coming today. It was so great to get to present to you all. And I'm so excited for the rest of this session. Back over to you, Jason. Perfect. I'm actually going to pass it to our friends over at HOSTA and they're going to share uh, some of their opportunities and their story. All right. Thanks, Jason. And thank you, Emily. Uh, we'd like to start off by thanking Tallow for organizing this wonderful event. Tallow has been a great partner of HOSTA for many years and they've helped us to run our scholarship program, collect leadership applications, and organize competitive event materials. We're extremely grateful for Tallow for providing our membership with so many opportunities to showcase all of our members' talent. The talent that's found in HOSA members worldwide is channeled to diligently serving as the pipeline to the future of healthcare. And now when it comes to healthcare, it's this really is an ever-changing system that seeks to prioritize the well-being of a population by utilizing comprehensive care and patient education through a system that puts active prevention, early diagnosis, effective and compassionate treatment that's paired with systematic post-care rehab. These are the characteristics of a good healthcare system, a system where health professionals put patients first. Individuals in healthcare exemplify a lifestyle, a lifestyle of service, a lifestyle of compassion, and a lifestyle of commitment to continually improving the scope of healthcare while healing the world with their knowledge. Future health professionals, it's not a job, it's a calling, a calling that can only be answered with insurmountable drive. You know, what excites me uh, is the magnitude of what it really means to be a HOSA member. Uh, we're an international student-led organization dedicated to empowering the future of healthcare. Uh, we were founded in 1976, and ever since then, we've grown, reaching around 250,000 members and 2.7 million alumni. We have chartered HOSA associations uh, across the globe, including American Samoa, Canada, China, Korea, and Puerto Rico, to name a few. Uh, and as Shree mentioned, as an organization, we really hope to fill workforce shortages in the healthcare industry by supporting the needs of future physicians, nurses, dentists, technicians, and so many more professionals uh, that will contribute to bettering the health of each and every one of us. Like Karthik said, annually, HOSA brings together over 250,000 middle school, secondary, and post-secondary collegiate members working towards the common goal of being better leaders, health professionals, and compassionate global citizens, something HOSA accomplishes through four key pillars. And one of those key pillars uh, is service. Service involvement ranging from impactful community cleanups, blood drives, canned food, food drives, and as well as other activities, working towards achieving HOSA's Barbara James Service Award opportunity. Uh, additionally, our members can become involved in our service project that HOSA delegates choose for our organization uh, to support. Uh, this year, we're so fortunate that our service project is Be the Match, an especially meaningful organization that uh, really can completely change the lives of both marrow donors as well as marrow recipients. Um, the beauty of our service project this year, Be the Match, uh, is in the fact that you can make a direct impact uh, on a patient's life. Uh, it really does go beyond fundraising and, and advocacy. It, it gives students the chance uh, to join the bone marrow registry uh, and save a life. And so uh, this level of intimacy and impact through service uh, here at HOSA Future Health Professionals is one of our key and topmost pillars. Service ties hand in hand with our next pillar, leadership. Good leadership is a highly coveted trait that organizations of all disciplines desperately need. The future of the world relies on the soft skill competency that individuals develop through meaningful, eye-opening experiences. HOSA offers this at the state level through fall and state leadership conferences. 
the workshops, networking opportunities, and learning activities come together to help you connect with people from around your state and strengthen your group teamwork abilities. And these are just a few key examples of ways to hone your leadership skills. Leadership isn't something you can learn in the classroom. Experiences like impactful workshops, seminars, and a constant blending of ideas is what molds leaders. And all of that can come from HOSA. Thanks, Hannah. Um, the next fundamental pillar uh, of HOSA is really refining technical skills through a robust competitive events program. As future health professionals, I know many of us are working diligently to apply to professional schools and the competitive edge needed to successful, success, successfully apply to those schools is something that is well integrated into a wide array of host of competitive events. Um, you know, being a good doctor, a good nurse, or, or a good health professional uh, is not only dependent on the ability to do well on exams or recall content, it's really a healthy balance between technical skills and, and our commitment to going above and beyond, uh, to apply that knowledge outside of the classroom. Uh, HOSA's competitive events program offers exactly that opportunity. Uh, through health science, health professions, recognition, teamwork, emergency preparedness, uh, and leadership events, members can really build on existing knowledge. Uh, they can critically analyze and address uh, major healthcare issues uh, and build some very important skill sets. Uh, through these opportunities, I think HOSA gives members a stage and an opportunity uh, to exemplify technical skill competencies, to potentially one day uh, make an impact in that field of health. Speaking of a stage, that brings us to the last pillar of HOSA, an opportunity to be recognized for your commitment and resilience at an international level. The sheer size and reach of HOSA carries prestige among universities, employers, and professional schools. They highly value candidates that can compete and win at such a level. This is a stage shared by scholarship recipients that tap into $6.2 million of scholarship funding extended to HOSA members. It is a stage that recognizes top tier students worldwide for their successes in service and competition. I'd also like to add that many of the competitive events, like Karthik said, like the National Geographic ATC exams, they are aligned to match subjects that appear on professional exams. Gaining recognition at the international level and technical knowledge is a great way to apply your knowledge outside of the classroom and receive recognition for your specific subject competencies. HOSA provides the perfect way for you to be recognized for the talent and drive I know you already have. Hannah, you brought up a, a lot of good points there, and I think we can both agree that, that HOSA has a lot to offer. Uh, it all comes down to how well and how much of it you decide to take advantage of. Uh, for me, that meant my freshman year in high school, seven years ago, getting involved in competitive events like medical spelling, terminology, prepared speaking, as well as developing my leadership skills, serving at my local, uh, regional, statewide, and now international levels. Uh, it meant developing some great connections, getting to know some of my very best friends, as well as networking with educators, with industry representatives, as well as government leaders, including at the Office of the U.S. Surgeon General. Uh, I joined HOSA seven years ago and can say that without a doubt that this organization has something for each and every member to take part in uh, and to learn from. After listening to this presentation, and if you find that our pillars match up with yours, we invite and look forward to seeing you join our HOSA family. This organization uh, is all about giving back. This family is all about giving back and paying opportunities forward uh, to the future of healthcare. Uh, impactful service opportunities, robust competitive events, personal growth, all those pillars that we mentioned are at the core of who we are. Uh, they really are at the root of each HOSA member's unique story. Uh, but what we would really love to hear uh, is your HOSA story. Uh, currently, HOSA is offering one $2,500 scholarship to a HOSA member that has shared their story on the Tallow community. And the deadline's October 31st, uh, and we will link that opportunity uh, in the chat as well for your reference. 
I'd like to thank all of you for joining us today. I know that that was quite a bit of information in a very short amount of time. So for those of you who have questions, we will be staying on after the panelists do their part of this presentation to answer any of those questions. However, if you can't stick around or you have questions that come up later on, don't be scared to follow us on our socials that you see on the screen or check out www.hosta.org for more information. Thank you, Hannah and Karthik. I'd now like to transition us into the future of healthcare panel. We have the privilege of having four amazing panelists with us today. Our first panelist is Ms. Kelly Hoover. Kelly is the Executive Vice, Vice President of MedCarts and is a customer journey enthusiast with over 10 years of operations leadership, strategy creation, and process design experience. Driven by curiosity and empathy, her expertise lies in big systems thinking and delivering incremental value to customers through data visualization and implementing solution-oriented frameworks in bureaucratic settings. Next up, we have Ms. Caitlin Krask. She is the Student Program Coordinator for Tidelands Health. She assists on clinical and non-clinical students as they further their education in healthcare. Through her role, she provides strategic alignment in the development and maintenance of internal and external relationships, in addition to the tracking, recruitment, and placement of students. Next, we have Dr. David Kelly, a resident physician at the Rutgers New Jersey Medical School. He first got involved with HOSA Future Health Professionals in 2009. He later went on to serve as the national president from 2012 to 2013 while studying at NYU and has remained involved in both moving HOSA Future Health Professionals forward as an organization and advocating for the future of healthcare. As a representative of HOSA FHP, he has spoken at government roundtables concerned with the advancement of America's health system, alongside exploring barriers to care access within disadvantages within disadvantaged populations. And last, we have Dr. Margaret Savoy. She is an, serves as the Senior Vice President for Education with the American Academy of Family Physicians. Dr. Savoy oversees all organizational activities related to medical education and continuing professional development. Her areas of focus include education and training of medical students and residents, the expansion of graduate medical education in family medicine, including through federal policies that affect it, and of course, the development of professional development opportunities for family physicians. So that being said, I'd like to go ahead and kick us off uh, panelists, as you can see on screen. Uh, I'd like to start off with some questions I'd be um, asking to the floor. What, what made each of you interested in the healthcare industry? We'd, we'd like to hear a little bit about your story in terms of your journey into healthcare and, and how, you are, how you got to where you are today. I guess I can start things off here. Thank you, Shree, for the introduction and the question. Um, you know, I first got interested in, in a health career, I think the same way that probably a lot of people on this call today got interested. I, I enjoyed the science. Um, you know, ever since uh, elementary and middle school, I, um, you know, I found that it made sense, um, you know, working through things logically. Um, and, you know, I, I just love the material, but what I was missing during those early science classes was a way to connect that to, uh, you know, service to people and working with people. Um, you know, I'm, I'm something of an extrovert, so I knew that, um, you know, working in a laboratory wasn't going to do it for me long term. I knew that, um, you know, I needed to be in uh, almost a, a customer service type oriented career, if you will. Um, and so I found that in healthcare, uh, you know, I, I just happened to take a course in high school um, that was affiliated with, with a HOSA program. Um, and I found that I love that I could connect the science material um, to, uh, you know, service for people, um, you know, in a very, a very stimulating way and in a way that, you know, I could build a career around. So it's interesting for me, it, it depends on who you ask. So if you ask my mom, my mom says, I told her when I was really young, I was going to be a doctor. Um, I told her I was either going to be a doctor, a lawyer or a nun. And so I ended up being a doctor. So that's great. It all worked out. But um, at the end of the day, um, I think what I like the best is that I'm nosy and I like people. 
Um, and so being a doctor and especially being a family doctor, like I get to know everybody's business about everything and I always know what's going on and I feel really included. Um, but most important, I get to spend time with them at some of their most important moments of their life. Um, and I get to have the opportunity, which is really a privilege. And I don't know if everybody thinks about it quite that way, but I literally get the privilege of being able to help guide people through some of the best days of their life and some of the worst days of their life. And regardless, I get to be a constant for them. And that's not something that everybody gets to have. And it's not something that everybody gets to experience. And so I feel really grateful about that. Um, I get to combine things that I really like. So, I mean, I, I was super nerdy and I always like science. I like to read. And so there's always things changing in medicine. And so you're constantly reading and staying up to date. Um, I actually happen to be an introvert, not an extrovert. So I actually kind of like the one-on-one -on -one time. And so you get to spend time with people in exam room or like in the, in the hospital, but you're talking to them sort of one-on-one -on -one and figuring out. But I really do love the fact that you can either zone in or zone out. So I can either talk to you and what's going on with you today, or I can ask you about your mom and your dad and your family, because often I get to take care of all of them. But then you're also part of a bigger community, right? So you get to talk about community things and thinking about advocating and like going to the hill and making sure patients have the food they need and the access to the things they need. And so, I mean, honestly, for me, healthcare touches every aspect of everyone because we're all human. And at some point we're all going to need healthcare. And so it's kind of like education for me in that space. And so I love the fact that I get to have a role in helping other people make really good decisions for themselves. And then I get to make sure that they have a voice that shows up in other places where maybe I can speak for people who can't. And so I get really lucky. I mean, it's a, it's a, real, a real privilege. And I don't know that it necessarily means you always have to be a physician. So I mean, while I personally think everybody ought to be a family physician, it's the best job ever. Um, I do appreciate that like, I couldn't do my job without other members of my team being just as passionate about their role in medicine as mine is. And so I just think there's lots of space and lots of room for people and the interests that they have. And so if you've only met one health professional and you think that doesn't feel like it's for you, that might not be true. You just might not have met the right, right people yet or the right, the right section of the healthcare system that really might intrigue you and get you very excited and passionate. Oh, I love that perspective. And um, I like what you mentioned that you just haven't met the right clinical professional. And that's kind of what I do in my um, position at Tidelands Health. I help students um, K through 12 and graduate level and medical students in their um, medical and healthcare education. And I help them get partnered up with someone who may show them what they would like to do in their future career. But the story that got me into healthcare, um, I am not on the clinical side, I'm on the non-clinical side, but I had a family member who was terminally ill and I was, I was traveling with them as I was their power of attorney. So I got to see day in, day out what they experienced. Um, I traveled through South Carolina and North Carolina and I was actually at a learning and teaching hospital in North Carolina. And I really enjoyed seeing um, how the, each department got together and cared for my loved one. And um, I love seeing the residents um, assist as well. Um, I really cherished all of those healthcare professionals that helped with my loved one. And so that gave me a love of healthcare and I was already in the business route at Clemson University. So, um, and I love the business aspect of healthcare as well. So on that track, I decided I wanted to go into healthcare, but on the non-clinical business side. And I just wanted to help individuals for the, their career, whether it is clinical or non-clinical, um, so they can help and treat patients who are just as sick as my loved one was. So um, I love my job and um, I look forward to doing it every single day. Yeah, similar to Caitlin, um, my background is in higher education. My first job out of college myself, I was a college counselor and I worked with all students, business backgrounds, criminal justice, but the students I loved working with the most were the ones who came in, maybe not entirely sure what they wanted to do, but said, I know I wanna help people. I know that it's a calling I have and I'm going to school and I wanna figure out how I can help people. And um, after getting to know those students, many of them went on to become nurses. Uh, some, some didn't though, they didn't feel like that was the position for them. So to Dr. Savoy's point, I think there's so many different um, niches in healthcare that someone can find and cling to. And that's when I ended up joining MedCerts two years ago. And we help students in the allied health professions. Um, so not doctors, not nurses, but all of the technicians and technologists that are needed. And, and what we find is so many of our students come to us and say, you know, I don't know anything about healthcare. I know I want to help people. How can I dip my toe in and find my, 
find the right path for me without having to sign up for a four-year, six-year, eight-year career path. And allied health seems to be a great stepping stone to get into the field and understand, oh, do I like the front office? And do I like the administrative portion? Do I like working with patients? Do I like working in a lab? Where do I fit in? Um, the credentials you know, take relatively a lot less time and are less expensive than jumping into a four or uh, four year degree. So it, it really is a great entry point. And I've just found that um, I really enjoy helping students find their path because they are so very passionate. Everyone has such an amazing story of why they wanna enter healthcare. So I love that uh, we get to help guide those students and find their fit. That's really awesome. Thank you so much for sharing your journeys and paths. I mean, I think it was really exciting to see how for one question, the depth of diversity that we have on this panel, it's really, it's really exciting to see how different uh, everyone's approach is. But a recurring theme that I saw is that of like servant leadership and service towards a group or a community that you are passionate about. So thank you so much for sharing your stories. Now uh, that brings me to my next question. Uh, I'd like to target these two. Uh, these question I'd like to mainly towards uh, Dr. Kelly and uh, Dr. Savoy, if you could maybe give your insights on what does it take to become a future health professional in a field that's increasingly becoming more competitive? And uh, Ms. Krask and Ms. Hover, I mean, if you want to, if you can give your perspectives in terms of your uh, sectors, that'd be great as well. So I think you ask a really great question. So one of the things that, um, that can't be denied is that the, the space is getting increasingly competitive so that people, you know, honestly, just listening to you talk about HOSA, I'm like, my God, I don't think I would get in at this point. Um, but like, you guys are just really talented. You're a talented bunch and you just keep getting smarter and more talented and having experiences that frankly, I didn't even think about until college. Now you're having them in middle and high school. And I think that's fantastic and it's wonderful. Um, but it does make it a little bit scary if you're thinking about, well, heck, if everybody's getting all these experiences, where does that leave me? And does that mean that I actually have an opportunity in a space um, what I generally tell students is that I wouldn't spend my time worrying about that. So that I know it sounds really flippant, but that'd be the least of my worries. What I really think you should be spending your time doing is stuff that you actually really enjoy. And so that if you're going out and exploring and you're spending time learning things and you're not doing it for the purpose of trying to get into medical school in 10 years or whatever, you're doing it because I just like this and I want to learn more about it and I'm growing and developing and shaping. I think what happens is that life sorts itself out. So that ultimately you will either find the program that works for you and matches with you and everything's not always about grades. Some of it's about fit and experience and the things that you're trying to do. Some schools are particularly looking for servant leaders who really want to do community work. Some people are looking for academic people that really want to write research papers. There's just a lot, there's a school for everybody. There's a spot for everybody in a place. But when I think about the future of healthcare in general, um, what I see happening doesn't involve a contraction of the number of people who are going to be needed to make this happen. What I actually see is an expansion, but I think the expansion is going to happen in ways that are just different and that people can't predict exactly what the role is going to be or what the space is going to be. And there are jobs that exist today that didn't even exist when I started you know, medical school, let alone when I was in middle school or high school. And so I can't tell you that there may not be a position for you that just doesn't look like anything that we have right now because something like COVID could come along and suddenly make telemedicine a thing. And it wasn't a thing two years ago. And now everybody does telemedicine. There's people who do that. And that comes with other challenges and work and things that have to happen. And I love the idea that we've got folks on, on the panel who don't necessarily do clinical medicine, because I think there is something to be said for it takes all kinds. There are people who literally never touch a patient and yet touch every patient because the work they do is what keeps the doors open and makes it possible for the space to exist and for people to get their work done. And so I wouldn't worry about the space getting to be more competitive. I would just worry about growing experiences that make me the very best me and then looking for what actually drives me and makes me passionate. And if you find the thing that drives you and makes you passionate, you are going to stand out above and beyond because the one thing that you have that no other student will ever have is your own story and no one can ever match your story. And if you're able to tell that story and explain how you got to be where you are, you almost always will find a space. Well, I completely agree with Dr. Savoy and she made so many good points, um, you know, particularly surrounding uh, just really the, the breadth of, uh, you know, new positions that are becoming available every day. Um, so I do think it's important to keep an open mind. Uh, you know, in the past, healthcare looked like one thing and, you know, there were a few tracks to choose from if you wanted to become uh, you know, a health professional. And now uh, there are so many opportunities out there that no one person could even know about. Um, 
So, you know, while, while there are certain spaces that are becoming more competitive, as Dr. Savoy, um, you know, discussed, there are so many more spaces that are just opening up uh, with positions to be filled. Um, and, you know, I also agree that finding something you're passionate about is going to really lead you to success because so much of success uh, revolves just around showing up. Um, I think oftentimes we, uh, we get bogged down in, um, you know, in any academic program, training program, and in grades and how well we perform on this, that, or the other, but so much of success uh, in education as well as in professional life is just about showing up um, and about caring about that particular task that you've shown up to do that day. Um, you know, I, I think I've heard people say it's 90% uh, is just showing up, being in the room. Um, so, you know, that's why things like this, where you didn't have to log on tonight and and um, you know, join this community to talk a little bit about where we think healthcare and health education could be headed. Um, but you did, and a lot of people didn't. Um, so sometimes that can be the difference between uh, you know success and not much more so than uh, you know a test grade or an item on a resume. And I'll go off that. Um, something I tell all my students is to always talk to healthcare professionals if that's what something you're interested in. Um, I know that a popular um, career is nursing and I tell my students, please go research it. Um, you might see the surface level on TV shows and um, movies, but that's not all that it entails. So I really encourage students to please go reach out to their, their providers or reach out to me and I'll um, assist them in partnering with a provider at Thailand's Health so they can have a conversation with a provider or a clinician just so they really understand and they can even observe hands off um, on site on what the job really entails. And um, with the internet, it's a great resource. You can go look up YouTube videos, you can research um, articles on what careers that may interest you the most. Um, I think those are great resources for students um, to start looking at, but truly enjoy your job because it will be something that you go to every day. I think I think those are some really great perspectives. I, I, as a recurring theme here, I think I see because it is competitive, be cognizant that it's competitive, but put the extra effort to really make sure this is what you want to do, and also do the things that you love. You know, follow your passions and what excites you. I think that's a really that was a really beautiful message I kind of got from all three of your responses. So thank you for that. Uh, that brings me to my third question. I'd like to ask, uh, what current or future workforce trends do you anticipate? occurring within your sector of the healthcare industry? Yeah, so um, really quickly when looking at like allied health, there's projections that that's anticipated to grow anywhere from 18 to 20% in the, in the next five years. And I think it's a function of a few things, an aging population, um, and also new technology that's coming out. So as new technology comes out, they're going to need technicians to work that technology and use it. Um, so I think there is this expansion that's happening and there doesn't seem to be um, an end in sight. There doesn't seem to be an end where, you know, to Dr. Savoy's point earlier, you know, we're all human and I, and I think we're all gonna need help and we're all gonna need to, to, to be checked out. And, and I think um, while, Healthcare and medicine might get more sophisticated. I think the element of needing people is not going anywhere. It just might be in different ways. And so we're seeing a lot of employers um, maybe shift how they look at the traditional roles they need. They're creating new roles. Um, they might be employing more medical assistants instead of nurses, or they might need more nurses instead of different types of people. But the, um, the need's there. It is, it's, it's the right industry to be in. I completely agree. So I think that um, I think the future of medicine is actually really fascinating because it involves really, really high touch and really, really high tech at the same time. And that's not very common. Like normally you flip to one or the other. 
And in this case, I think there's going to be some really fascinating jobs to kind of keep an eye out for. So I actually don't think that we're going to have all the doctors that we need to take care of people. And as a family physician, I can tell you, we don't have enough primary care doctors. And I, I don't think we're going to have any problem of having too many primary care doctors anytime soon. And so people who are interested in taking care of people sort of in that frontline space, I think there's going to be plenty of room for you. So I wouldn't worry about that. Like we have enough people who are living long enough. There's going to be more than enough space for folks in that place for a good long time to come. Where I think there's some interesting new things to think about is that all of this high tech stuff doesn't necessarily always involve the clinical side. So there's things like, for example, tests that you can do now on genetics that help you figure out things about people. Well, somebody's got to draw the blood and somebody's got to send off the test. Somebody's got to be able to actually run the test and somebody's got to be able to interpret the test and somebody's got to be able to figure out how to help patients navigate the results of the test. Somebody has to develop the new drugs that you use to treat the things that you find out now that you never knew were things because we never had the test before. And as, as crazy as that sounds, all of those things are happening in leaps and bounds like every day. So the, just the speed at which things are getting um, developed and figured out, you've already seen it with COVID, how fast they can figure out how to develop a vaccine, how fast they can figure out how to make a medication, how you can apply those things to other things. Now figure out, well, how does this apply to other diseases and other things that are going on? That pace isn't going to slow down. There's so many other things still left to do. And so I actually think it's a really intriguing time to consider healthcare because I think that there's so many different aspects. And for the people who really don't necessarily like people, like you didn't want to be the people person, but you are super good at math and dollars, somebody's got to figure out how to pay for all this stuff. And somebody's got to figure out how to keep the doors open and how to make sure that the finances are okay. And healthcare finances aren't really that simple. And so being able to figure out how you might be able to stand in that space is also really important. And there's even people who are now into the marketing space of healthcare because there's so many different tools and things that are being marketed to people and figuring out how to help them have a healthier life at home and being able to take care of themselves outside of the hospital or the doctor's office. And so when I think about healthcare, it just expands and expands and expands because it really is the, the corner, the cornerstone to us being alive is being healthy. If we're not healthy, we can't do any of the other stuff we need to do. And so we're always going to be investing and looking for ways to make sure that's a thing. And then your job is to figure out where you fit in. What is it that excites you and makes you really, really interested, intrigued? What makes you like read the extra chapter even though you didn't have to? That's what you wanna then figure out how that intersects with medicine somewhere and how we might be able to pull you into the healthcare field that way. And I think regarding medical education specifically, um, I can think of really two major trends that really interlock. So I, I think the trend that has already uh, certainly is already taking place um, was uh, really medical schools in particular, but uh, really all sectors, I would say, of health starting to look at uh, applicants wholly as people, not only, um, you know, as, as test takers or, um, you know, as test interpreters, if you will. So, uh, you know, they, they realized that about 15, 20 years ago, um, I'd say they needed to make a change. They needed to, uh, you know, start looking for folks who could connect with patients. Um, we started to realize that so much of healthcare uh, actually falls to the patient. You know, after they leave the office, uh, you have to have the skills, um, skills like HOSA imparts to its members. Um, you know, starting from an early, uh, earlier in their educational careers. Um, you know, just those same skills that they discussed earlier. Uh, with being able to teach your patients, uh, being able to understand your patients, have empathy. Um, it's very important that patients feel cared for, feel understood, feel heard. Um, and, you know, because of that, they need good communicators. Uh, you know, you, you can't have a bunch of physicians and a bunch of health professionals who, uh, you know, are, are good at taking tests, but aren't good at talking to patients about uh, their issues and, you know, their thoughts, their fears, their concerns. So uh, I think that kind of connects with the other major trend that I think we'll see going forward. And Dr. Savoy, I think briefly kind of alluded to this as well. Um, we're seeing that uh, a transition from a focus wholly, wholly on health care to a focus on one of health itself. Um, and that has a couple of benefits. Uh, you know, it's better for patients. Um, and it's also better from a health systems perspective. So, uh, for example, um, you know, educating patients about, uh, you know, 
heart disease and how diabetes affects various parts of the body. Uh, that sounds expensive up front, and it is. It's hard to do up front. You need good communicators and you have to put resources in. Um, but ultimately, uh, it's going to be better for the patient and it's going to be a heck of a lot cheaper for the health system uh, if we're able to avoid that patient having to come to the uh, ED after having a heart attack or a stroke in 10 or 15 years. Um, so, you know, I, I think that's something that the, the healthcare industry in general has, um, you know, really been delinquent on for, for some time. Um, you know, we're really, really, really good at uh, keeping people alive and at uh, finding uh, more specialized and advanced testing and uh, treatments to do. Um, but I think now we're realizing that so much of medicine um, is really the basic stuff. Uh, and so once we're able to, um, you know, really focus on just those core uh, measures of health with people and really, um, you know, educate our patients about how they can stay healthy, stay out of the hospital, um, you know, in some ways, I think the future of healthcare is more to do with health than it does, uh, you know, the, the advanced care that we often think about in the 21st century. Yeah, those are some great points. Huh? Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Savoy and Dr. Kelly, for Ms. Kras, for providing insights on that. And I think a recurring theme that I caught from is this, this idea of teaching and uh, learning during, and even during the COVID era. And it kind of made me connect to a question from, we had from the audience. Uh, someone was asking that I've tried to volunteer and shadow at local clinics, but due to COVID, this has been very tough. Do you have any suggestions to make the best out of this time? And how can I get real experience even during COVID as times when maybe uh, getting opportunities like shadowing and research are very difficult or be, you're being uh, very quickly turned down? Um, so in my day-to-day -day role, I do offer individuals opportunities at the local hospital system and outpatient facility shadowing opportunities and um, volunteer opportunities. And it is limited right now um, due to COVID, but I would continue um, reaching out to the hospital system, probably maybe at the beginning of the new year, um, and just keep on, um, be determined. Just keep asking, um, maybe ask a different healthcare system. And like I said, go on Google and YouTube and find different videos and articles and um, tutorials, and it'll explain to you. I mean, it's not as great as going in in person, but it just gives you a feel since the opportunities are limited right now with COVID-19. One of the places that I've found that um, folks have had success is um, being helpful in some of the actual COVID efforts. So I know that um, many of the people who had an interest in just seeing some of what people were doing um, did get the opportunity to volunteer, for example, and I'll use the term and you may not know what it means. That's OK, because I'll explain it in something called contact tracing, for example, where they were teaching people how to figure out who were the people who actually gave the people that were there the COVID. Um, and so there was sort of actual training that they figured out that needed to happen and it needed to go out in a public health way. And sometimes people forget that public health is also healthcare. Um, and so you can actually learn a lot of very, very important key principles about things that will actually translate very well into whatever healthcare field you wanna go into, working sometimes through the public health side. And while, for example, the hospital can't have you standing in the exam room with people because they have to limit the number of people in the room, if we're going out and doing something like contact tracing where there's lots of space or we're doing testing where there's lots of space and they may be able to train you to do it, you might actually have some more opportunities in that space. So it may be a little different than what you were imagining when you first sort of thought about what you wanted to go do. But I've had people had some really um, very interesting experiences and learned a lot about people getting a chance to interview people in that space, helping to do some of that work. And so that may be a space to consider as you're sort of thinking through it until we sort of get to the other side of COVID when we can have more people sort of closer together in spaces. Right. Thank you so much. I mean, I think I think those those were some great points. Uh, take, making the most of our times and taking, I think, seeing it from a different uh, perspective is really important. Uh, you know, looking at it from a public health approach and kind of understanding what the role of healthcare is, and especially in a COVID era, is all the more uh, relevant to our fields. I think we have time for about one more question, and uh, it'd be great if I could get insights from everybody on the panel here today. Uh, but if you could go back to your high school, maybe early college self and share some advice to that version of you. 
as aspiring future health professionals or individual leaders in your industries, what would it be? I think I would tell myself, uh, that's a great question. I think it's causing us all to think. I think I would tell myself not to be as concerned about a career ladder where you're going straight up and really look at life as more of a trellis. So sometimes you're making lateral moves, um, but it's so important. And then you have a, spot, a stronger foundation when you grow, almost like scaffolding instead of a ladder. And I think um, the experiences I had in school were excellent. The experiences I had outside of school were so much more valuable in some cases. And I think finding those connection points and finding your passion um, and relating that back to the things you want to learn and staying hungry to learn those things would be the, where it would be the advice I'd give. So I would say like, Kelly, don't stress about the ladder. Don't constantly look for the next step and the next opportunity and next up. Be open to all opportunities and make those opportunities work for you. I think my number one would be probably to connect with mentors earlier on. Um, you know, there's there's nothing like having the experience of another person and someone to bounce ideas off of, someone to offer guidance uh, who has been uh, just where you were before. Um, and you know, again, that's that's something that can be difficult to find, uh, and it's something. Um, but you know, even even if you're not sure what you want to do, still developing relationships with, with folks that are in uh, fields that you think you might be interested in, you learn so much. And even if the thing that you learn is that maybe you don't want to, you know, pursue that particular field or, or job as a career, um, that's just as valuable as, uh, you know, insights into eventually what you do want to do. So, you know, I think cultivating those, uh, you know, those professional relationships with people early on um, would be the number one thing. I think probably a lot of us, uh, you know, we, uh, we think, oh, maybe they don't want to be bothered or it's too early. You know, I, I'm too young to be, um, you know, thinking about, uh, you know, having a, a physician mentor, for example, a, a nurse mentor, an allied health mentor. Um, because I'm only in middle school or high school, but you learn very quickly that um, ultimately people's nature is, is to help each other and, and people love sharing uh, their passion uh, for their careers. And so um, I definitely encourage everyone, you know, to, to put yourself out there as far as uh, making connections um, because, you know, you never know the, the doors that those people can open for you. I agree. And um, to piggyback off that, um, never be afraid to ask questions. Even if you think it's a stupid question, it's not. And people will be more than happy to help you and help guide you. Um, and it's good to just have conversations with people because you may, um, like we previously discussed, you may want to go into nursing, but then you might really see that you have a passion for respiratory. And so there's always these different outlets within, within healthcare, and that's the glory of it. Um, there's so many different career paths. There's so many things to learn. It is an industry that is continuously changing and it will never go out of style. It'll always be here. People always need help and always need care. Um, so don't be afraid to ask questions and just go for what you love. I love all your answers. Like high school Margo could have used all that information really, really well. Um, I think if I were gonna pick one thing that I would have told myself, it probably would be to relax. Um, I spent a lot of time worried um, that um, that I wasn't going to be able to make it work. So I, for me, I was the first one in my family to go to college that way. And I was the only one that ever thought about medical school. And everybody else in my family sort of was like, if that's what you want to do, great. But they really didn't know like what the next steps were supposed to be. So I spent a lot of excess time worrying about like what the next step was supposed to be or whether you had done enough or you'd done the right thing or you did what you needed to do. And so I think if I had done a better job of doing what David said, which is making sure that I had mentors who maybe knew, and I don't even think I knew that a mentor was a thing then. So being able to connect myself to some of those things and know that that's what people normally do. Um, and honestly, spending more time enjoying the journey. So there are lots of times where I think I spent way too much time being stressed out about the difference between a 97 and a 98. 
when really I should have just went out and enjoyed my time with my friends because this is my life and I only get to live it once. And every experience that you have in life makes you a better physician or a better healthcare professional on the other side. And so it's not just about being book smart. It's not just about um, what you can do in that space. It's also about you being healthy and whole. Um, and so being able to balance that, I think is something that I wish I could have put back way back in the beginning, I could have instilled in myself. So that it was easier when I got to the parts where it got a little harder to be able to make that happen. But honestly, I feel so grateful and blessed and lucky every day that I get to get up and do the job that I have that um, honestly, I would just give future, a few, little me would give a high five to future me because it all worked out. And I think it'll all work out for you guys too. Right. That, that's, that's amazing. That's, that's really awesome to hear. Thank you so much for sharing, uh, sharing all that, all the panelists. Thank you. And taking, thank you for taking the time to chat with us today and giving those insights. We're extremely grateful for your decision to share your time with us today. Uh, attendees, we hope you enjoyed this opportunity to learn from our panelists. And that being said, if you have any questions, feel free to stay on for the host of Q&A session uh, to ask any questions you have. But besides that, that concludes this uh, session. Thank you so much. Yes, I see. Uh, please go ahead. I mean, if, to ask the questions, go ahead. And if you could maybe drop it in the Q&A session, uh, that might be a little bit easier so we can kind of feed the questions. But if you have any questions about HOSA that Karthik, Hannah, and myself can answer, uh, we'd be happy to um, answer them to the best of our abilities. I see a, a great question in the chat. What do you, or excuse me, in the Q and A, what do you do with HOSA after high school? Can you still stay in it? That's a great question, Karthi. You want to start us off with this one? Sure thing. I think that's a great question. I mean, uh, HOSA right has opportunities for students at the middle school, high school, or secondary level, as well as post secondary and collegiate level. So you can definitely stay a part and involved in HOSA uh, at a collegiate institution, but you can also uh, choose or elect to uh, gain alumni membership after high school if that's the route you choose. And so there's really a lot of opportunity and flexibility there. If you're more interested in competitive events and continuing that HOSA experience in a college at a, at a collegiate chapter, that's something you can do. Or if you're more interested uh, in the benefits and perks of an alumni membership, uh, such as discounts on professional uh, opportunities and professional resources, uh, HOSA's job uh, database, job and, and internship database and things like that. Uh, you can also elect to apply for alumni membership, which is free and easy to do for all graduating seniors in high school. And so you can do either of those things or you can continue to be involved. It's really up to our members and how much they wanna be involved. Right. And just to add on to what uh, Karthik said, I, I think I think it's very important that especially if you've been involved with HOSA uh, throughout high school, showing that con continuation of being involved, invested in an organization that you share that you share those values within high school, it really holds a certain value, um, especially when as, as aspiring future health professionals, even at the collegiate level, showing uh, competency in these skills and these events and these scholarship opportunities are just a few things that you can tap into at a very reasonable, uh, you know, when it comes to membership, for a very fair membership, I, I, from what I've noticed, especially with some of the other on-campus orgs, uh, maybe Hannah can also give some insight in terms of what she's seen with other orgs, but the value that you get in the membership in terms of uh, continuing that relationship, 
taking being recognized on an international stage and showing technical tangible skill set rather than just being in a networking uh, health organization or a, a fraternity the medical fraternity for example I think the value of that is far supersedes any of the, some of the other orgs that I've seen on my campus Anna do you have anything to add to that yeah, absolutely. I highly encourage you to continue HOSA as you enter into the post-secondary collegiate world in any way you can. And not too long ago, I was probably seeing where you are now as a senior in high school, wanting to stay involved in this organization. And a great way that you can do that is by reaching out to your state advisor, no matter where you're at, because a lot of those states have that same goal of being in as many post-secondary institutions as they can. And, you know, HOSA is one of the few organizations that you could be in for eight years or even longer as an active member. So go ahead and take the opportunity. There's no other organization, at least on my campus, it's like that. And it holds obviously the most value and opportunity in comparison to any other organization. I see another question in the chat um, asking about what volunteer opportunities are provided by HOSA. Uh, this is a really interesting question. So uh, one of HOSA's main when we're oriented around services to supporting our service project. This year, it's, we've had the privilege, I think you guys may have heard Karthik mention is Be the Match, uh, the bone marrow transplant service. And we try to do and build and generate uh, volunteer opportunities for you to get involved, advocate for that, uh, be able to set up drives so and educate uh, the general public in terms of signing up for the registry. And really, you're using up all your skills, really your interpersonal skills to convince and persuade someone to see value in something that uh, the delegation of HOSA sees value in, right? Uh, that's one of our primary service opportunities. And in terms of uh, local scale, a lot of our chapters, the beauty of HOSA really is that our individual chapters actually have a lot of autonomy in terms of how uh, it's run, whether that's at the state or local school level. And I've seen service activities from canned food drives, blood drives, uh, hosting blood drives in conjunction with uh, educating for the bone marrow and joining the match. Uh, I've seen I've seen a couple of general fundraising as well, just, you know, basic bake sales and whatnot. Some things as simple as those to some chapters I've seen get very, really creative where they're working with local clinics and uh, volunteering under under that clinical service. Uh, maybe Karthik and Hannah can add to that if there's something that they've seen in their states. Yeah, I think that this is a wonderful question. I think uh, something so unbelievable and amazing here at HOSA is that it's not service for service's sake. I know in a lot of organizations, we see that, right? I think it's it's really focused on taking a look at service opportunities for community impact. As future health professionals, how can we get into the community and support our communities? And we've seen that need increase as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. If it's through COVID-19 contact tracing support staff, if it's through gaining those professional certifications, like pharmacy technician certifications, CNA, a certified nursing assistant, uh, supporting communities through uh, EMT uh, and su supporting our communities that way. I think that that theme of supporting local communities, state communities has been something that we see continuously through HOSA and it's demonstrated through not only service but also volunteering and, 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 and that sense of servant leadership. I just want to reiterate the importance and the unique opportunity that HOSA has with Be The Match. This isn't every year that you get to see such an impactful organization. These two organizations come together to work with each other. And I know a lot of the time when you think of that, you think of fundraisers and different things like that. But with Be The Match, you can also do swab drives where you have a donor drive where you're just trying to get people to register. It doesn't necessarily have to be money. I know sometimes with local chapters that can be difficult, but you are making just as much as an impact by doing a swab or donor drive as well. So make sure you look into Be The Match and its partnership with HOSA and see what your local chapter can do to be a part of this amazing partnership. All right, I see another great question. Uh, it says, is there a place where you meet in person for HOSA? So uh, maybe this would be a great time to kind of explain the overall structure. I won't get into too, uh, it won't be too detailed, but hopefully it will give you a general idea of kind of how HOSA works. Um, 
So basically, you're going to start with your local chapter level, right? At your school, uh, you're going to prepare, do service opportunities, work with your uh, local schoolmates. Typically, you're working towards a competition. And at high school, this competition is at the regional conference, where there'll be uh, a couple other high schools, depending on the size couple, to uh, a few more, um, maybe anywhere from sometimes I've seen regional conferences with 50 plus schools. And you compete here uh, within others from that region. You receive an award and typically you'll progress on to the state conference. At state conference, you have hundreds of schools from all over your state competing for this. And then from states, you progress uh, th through to your international conference as the top three from each state within your competing event. Sometimes you can go to internationals even off of like uh, healthcare issues exams or National Geographic testing center events as well. Uh, those are our kind of our three main uh, conferences, if you will, that we kind of uh, host some meets. Outside of these, we also have conferences that we recently had in September was a Washington Leadership Academy, where that conference is very centric around training our members to reaching, you know, uh, being leaders in the healthcare industry beyond technical skill competency that these uh, other conferences that I just mentioned focus on is to building ourselves as leaders. And this past year, we had a strengths-based leadership training program where we had a leadership coach to uh, work with us. And we kind of were able to implement and teach a program of work that really teaches you how to get the most out of not only your host experience and your time as a future health professional, but throughout all aspects of life. Um, WLA is pretty exciting. Then we also, and I think that that those are the those are our four main conferences, if you will. Um, am I missing anything? I don't think I'm missing anything, am I? No, I think I think you hit it all. I mean, I although most attendees at these amazing in-person conferences do focus around a competitive event experience, I know there's so many professional development, training, networking uh, opportunities, symposium, educational symposia opportunities. Uh, that all of our attendees take advantage of. And it's so exciting now, uh, as Shri mentioned, our Washington Leadership Academy this past September, really returning in person after uh, over a year, over a year and a half, uh, really seeing how important and how effective uh, that connection, that firsthand in-person connection is again. Uh, if you're, you're looking to get involved, uh, definitely take a look at your school's host of chapter. If you don't have a host of chapter, it's an easy way to, 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 to make one and to start one. Uh, I know Hannah has some experience with that, as do a, a few of us. So definitely reach out to hosts of future health professionals. Uh, but yes, definitely send us an email. Um, uh, but there is opportunities for all, all sorts of folks, depending on your interests, uh, regardless of if you want to compete or not. I know a big part of what we all look forward to now after COVID and the pandemic era, as we continue through this pandemic era, is you know in-person activities. But I want to remind you all of the value of virtual opportunities that HOSA provides, like the one that we had here with Talo today. I hope you all can agree with me that we learned quite a bit about the future of healthcare. So don't knock out those benefits just because they're virtual. They can actually be really interesting and connect people from across the country, from around the world. You know, they're from our three alone, we are from different places, different time zones, and we get to see each other here today we get to talk with all of you. So don't disregard those virtual opportunities. In fact, grab a hold of them now because they are what is going to shape our futures. All right, I see another great question. Uh, it's asking about what are our goals? Um, I guess I could start really quickly. Uh, my personal goal is I'm a junior in college right now. And uh, my, I am aspiring to go in towards medical school. I'm looking to, I'll be taking a gap year to continue working after my commitments with HOSA end and I'll finish graduation in my senior year. And then I'll be applying to medical school uh, with the intent to hopefully become a physician. I'm kind of open to a lot of specialties and I'm counting on rotations in a medical school to help me figure out what exactly it is. But one of my passions are in pediatrics. So I'm probably going to be specializing in something in pediatrics. Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, so I'm currently a, a junior at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill uh, studying public health, health policy and management. Uh, I've always been interested in health and health care. Uh, recently, I see, I've seen that shift more towards public health, health policy, as well as government and advocacy. And so uh, I am interested in, in the intersection of those fields. 
um, but maybe a, a little less of that traditional medical school route now that I've started thinking about that a whole lot more in this last year or two. Uh, maybe even law school, I'm still figuring that out, but I am interested in, in those sort of uh, realms. Yeah, I am a freshman in college right now, not like these old guys over here. Um, so I have a little bit of time to kind of figure out what I want to go into. However, right now I am interested in continuing my education at a medical school. Right now, what really interests me is fertility and women's health. So I think that might be what I'm going into. However, I am always open to new things, as you all should be too, because like Karthik said, plans change. As as long as we keep being passionate and excited about what we're going into, like the three of us are, you will find your way to success. Right. Another uh, great question. As an introvert, how can HOSA improve social abilities? I, I thought this was a really exciting question because this is something I learned from someone on my team this year. Actually, he's not on this call with us. Um, but even on my team right now, right, I, it's a team of eight, including myself and it's really amazing to see the kind of the range of personalities on the team. You have the far end uh, extroverts and you have the far end introverts. It's a very well-oiled machine when we work as a team. And I think that uh, that applies to HOSA overall in terms of what it can do for different personalities is it exposes you to multiple different uh, personalities in multiple various settings. So I'm also going to tie this into one of the other questions that talks about uh, where can you network or how can you network within the HOSA community is within these conferences, right? You're attending these conferences, these fall leadership ac academies locally in the state, your regional conferences, your state conferences, up to ILC, your international conferences. Meeting different people is going to expose you uh, to different personalities and mindsets. It's going to expand your view of the world, right? And what's neat about it is there's just enough commonality between everybody where a lot of you have I've, a lot of our, all, not a lot, all of our members in HOSA have a, one thing that kind of unites them is that drive to be a servant leader, that drive to make an impact. You know, sometimes it may not even be in directly in healthcare, but it's more that, that drive to make an impact and seeing those passions from other people will really open you up and expose you to different leadership styles, different communication styles. And it's, it, it just gets really exciting because you're working and networking with all these individuals that one day you might be their boss or they might be your boss. Right. And I think that's something that's really exciting. And in terms of uh, networking, uh, to address that second part of that question that I saw, we're also looking, uh, we're as, as a team this year, we're looking to set up platforms to maintain connection between states and between individuals. Uh, and one of our ways that we're intending to do this is through that Tallow community. Uh, it's a platform on Tallow that we're looking to kind of increase engagement with HOSA members where you can meet HOSA alumni like we saw with Dr. Kelly, uh, past HOSA president, and now he's a resident doctor, where hopefully a, a nice mix between alumni as well as current members, you'd be able to kind of share your badges as well as your current involvements in HOSA and kind of connect with others, right? Other, others involved in opportunities, whether it's I'm in Florida and I can talk to somebody in New York or Washington and kind of get an idea as to what others are doing. So hopefully through the Tallow community, if you are a host, a member, if you're looking to join, keep an eye out for that from our Instagram. We will be sharing a lot of information. That will be a great place, especially in a very virtual world to um, a network and meet individuals beyond those in-person conferences. I want to go back to that little introvert question now. Personally, I am not an introvert. When Shri made that scale of far extrovert to far introvert, I'm on the far extrovert side of that, that's for sure. However, one of the members on our team, he's the exact opposite of that. He's very introverted. He's very deliberative in what he says. Um, sometimes he just sits there and listens. And then whenever he speaks, we all go silent because we know his opinion is very, very important and well thought out. In addition to that, just because you're an introvert, don't count yourself out for other skills that extroverts may more typically have. For example, this team member of ours is one of the best presenters on the team. Even though you would think introverts, they wouldn't want to speak in front of people. 
However, when he does it, he is amazing at it and is an engaging and dynamic speaker. Speaker. So don't limit yourself to a personality test. Realize that your strengths may extend beyond a simple label. You might be an introvert, but you also might work really well in public speaking or be the best team member. You never know. So make sure you explore your other strengths beyond that label. I mean, I think Hannah said it best, right? Exploring strengths beyond the labels. It's so easy to fall under that trap of labeling ourselves and, and, and saying what we can or shouldn't do uh, as opposed to what we can uh, and should do. And I think that's what HOSA helps us figure out. As it relates to the question, I personally, my uh, as a middle school student going into high school, I was quite shy and reserved myself. And I think that naturally that's that's what I was. And so trying to figure out, uh, A, what matters to me, right? I've found over time that uh, relationships matter. Building relationships with people uh, is very important to me. And B, how do I do that? It's through maybe uh, finding myself in new situations that I didn't uh, imagine I would. Uh, one of those examples is being here with you tonight. Uh, being in this opportunity. So finding new ways to challenge and build skill sets that you might not traditionally uh, uh, would have thought that you'd be in. Uh, and, and also doing that uh, while enjoying the journey. I think enjoying the journey is of utmost importance, especially in times where we've realized that uh, there's a whole lot going on uh, for different people from different backgrounds and different areas of our, uh, our country as well as across the globe. So really enjoying the journey you're on uh, while you're on it is very important for my end. A little fun little question here. Uh, is college hard? So uh, <laughs> this is a good one. Uh, college is hard, but as with everything, right, at every point in your life, you're always going to be progressing to more difficult uh, hills. Like I, I'll say college is hard, and then I get to medical school, and then I look back, and college was cakewalk, right? Um, I think it is difficult, but that's what's really exciting about like as as humans, right? When we when we're faced with a hurdle or a challenge, and if we keep a growth mindset to improve and get better from it, sure you might fall and you might get a little bruised, but I think you bounce back from it and you get you become better. And that's really what's the beauty of college is it gives you a chance to uh, elevate yourself, really explore yourself as a person. I remember telling my team this. I said once I got to college, uh, it's like rapid growth in such a short amount of time. It's it's really really crazy. Um, but that was my take on college. I think, but I think besides that, it's a really great time. It's a really, really good time. And it, and it feels amazing to be in college. Finally. I, uh, sort of similar to Shree's point there. I couldn't, uh, recognize the person I, I was uh, coming into first year of college as I am now. So definitely a lot of room for growth. Uh, also a lot of room for, uh, decisions, right. Where, where you have to actually field out all the options and say, what do I actually think? Uh, is is uh, of interest to me, right? In high school, you might be like, well, I'm interested in health, or I'm interested in healthcare, or oh, I want to be a doctor. But maybe when you're in college, you have to think, do I want to be a doctor? What type of doctor? Am I interested in healthcare, or am I interested in, uh, in, in public health, or am I interested in, in another aspect of caring for people? Uh, because the fact is that there's so many ways to care for people outside of healthcare. There's so many ways to make a difference in the lives of people than this field. And so really being able to, 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 to prioritize that and find those, uh, those opportunities and, and, and make those decisions for me has been one of the most challenging but also rewarding parts uh, of a college experience. Uh, and it's crazy to think that Shree and I will be graduating next year. So <laughs> hopefully that goes well. You know, when I saw this uh, question in the q and I had to smile to myself a little bit because um, I've just been, you know, this is my first semester of college. So uh, right now I'm going through that very fast growth, that fast paced movement towards the future, um, looking at all these different decisions that I have to make out of what seems like a very short time period. Um, but, you know, the academics are difficult as it is in any major that you go into, whether it's in healthcare and STEM or otherwise. Um, but what I've found is that even when it's difficult and when it's hard, if you enjoy what you're doing, you will find a way to do it. Um, for example, I had a chem test today. Now I'm not very good at chem. I spend a lot of hours studying chemistry to get okay at it. Um, but every time I waver in that, I remember, hey, this is what my future patients are going to need. This is what 
I'm going to need to be of service later. So if you find that passion in yourself, whatever it may be, whatever drives you, you'll find that despite all of the difficult decisions, hard classes, fast paced growth and all those difficulties, you'll be able to overcome them. Or at least I hope you will. That's what I keep telling myself as now, but obviously these other two have more experience than I do in that. Another great question is how do you prepare for competitive events and host events, right? Uh, that's a really great one. I think we can all give a little bit of insight because prior to serving HOSA, uh, all of us had the, you know, we had the, we, we used to compete in a lot of different events and whatnot and preparing for these events. The straight answer is each of the competitive events that you have HOSA puts out guidelines and in those guidelines it outlines resources. A lot of events use the DHO textbook and a lot of that from those textbook, you would do your diligence as to outside of your classroom setting, you're going to work to layer in knowledge from that textbook and other sources to understand a concept, whether it's CPR and first aid, you're going to be Karthik's linked in the chat. Thank you, Karthik. CPR and first aid, for example, uh, when you're preparing for that, you also, you have to show technical understanding of the skills, right, to answer an exam and then actually perform the test. And a lot of that comes with practice. So looking at those and doing practice questions uh, through this textbook, the textbook offers a lot of resources in terms of, uh, you know, little quiz, little mini quiz banks, as well as um, uh, your little, uh, with, throughout that textbook resources outline, right? And then also additional resources that are, in addition to the main stuff, additional resources for your exploration. Next part of it is practice, especially in those uh, skills where you need to act something out or you're speaking. A lot of it comes down to practice. And that really is the core of what it comes down to is we're trying to drill in the concept as future health professionals. A lot of what we need to do is coming from practice. Medicine is a practice. You know, is a lot of everything that we do is practice makes perfect. It's continually repeating a task to perfect perfection. And that's what these kind of uh, events really do. So I'd say follow the guidelines. That's one great spot. Um, Outside of the guidelines, always look for uh, some other events like PSA, public service announcement, for example. Also, we'll also put out samples of previous winners so you can kind of see what works as, a, as, a, as event samples. So I'll let uh, Hannah and Karthik elaborate if there's any other resources that, in terms of preparing for competitive events that you'd like to add. Yeah, I think first things first, right, with those guidelines is understanding that each category of competitive events that HOSA offers is different and that different events will require different sort uh, of skill sets or, or studying uh, methods. Uh, if you're practicing, say, a skills, skills event for like a nursing event versus a more a study oriented event like uh, pathophysiology, they'll require different skill sets. So when you're, you're uh, trying to get involved in a competitive event experience, one of the first things that I'll say as, as advice there is really understanding what you want to get out of the experience and, and what skill set do you want to build. Uh, it, it looks different for everybody. Some folks are more creative challenged and so, uh, or excuse me, creative uh, oriented. And so they'll, they'll go more towards events like extemporaneous health poster or, or creative events. Uh, other folks really want to build those skills. So they'll focus on CERT skills or emergency response skills or uh, EMT skills. And so uh, it's really up to, to our members to decide, A, what, what skills do they want to build and two, uh, what what interests them. And so those, uh, I think once you figure those questions out, it'll help you prepare a whole lot better uh, in addition to the resources that are published on our website at hosa.org. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I love those guidelines. I, they've said it, I'll say it a million times. You hear it a billion times. Whoever you ask in those are those older host members you might have at your school or at state conferences, they're gonna be like, read the guidelines because um, that will help you out the most. But my biggest tips for you guys personally is one, start early. You can't get anything done the week before conference. Um, there's tallow deadlines for some events. There's studying deadlines for some events. Tests sometimes in some states have to be taken early. Be aware of those deadlines and start working early. You know, around this time, hopefully you have a decent idea of maybe a few events you're interested in. Um, hopefully by the end of this month or next month, you'll have a pretty solid idea of what you wanna do for your conferences. 
And then beyond that, I'd say don't be scared to do the events that don't seem as healthcare related, especially to my people on this call who are freshmen, sophomores, and middle school even. You know, do the events even if you're a little bit scared of the healthcare, still participate. So one of my favorites that I like to recommend is job seeking skills, where in this event, you get to create a resume, a cover letter, and go through a mock interview. This is something that you might even need while you're still in high school, or you'll need in the next couple of years when you're looking for a part-time job. It's not specific to healthcare, and it's a skill that all of us need. So you might as well dip your toe in the water that way. And then later on, as you get deeper into your HOSA career, you can explore those more difficult events and see what else you want to do as you know what you want to do with your future and you can be more specific to yourself. But don't be scared to do something more general, something more of a soft skill, and then later on move into those technical skills that HOSA offers as well. Find that balance too. But those would be my two biggest pieces of advice for preparing for events. Right, Hannah, that was some great advice. I mean, that was that was really good. Um, I would def I definitely second everything that you said. I think I think that's a great way to maximize your OSA experience. I think we're looking to wrap the call up at about it's about seven thirty. So we'll look to answer one last question, and I really like this question. It's uh, I think this would be a great way to close off as well. Someone asks, in the moments when you feel unmotivated, unmotivated, or want to give up, what do you think about to keep you going? This is a really, really good question. So kind of tying in uh, that college question from earlier, college will toss a lot of instances where you will feel that way. There will be classes that you'll struggle in, either in high school, there will be classes that you'll be struggling in. There will be unforeseen obstacles and circumstances that are gonna come your way. No one anticipated COVID, COVID came our way. There will be different life instances that's gonna take over and completely take things, uh, change the trajectory of things. but the thing that we have to, as many of us as aspiring future health professionals, is something that I read recently was that to be a future health professional, it doesn't require someone to be in an in, in insanely amount of, you know, insane amount of IQ, a high, very high level IQ or very smart. What it requires is a high level of tenacity. It requires the ability to be able to, you know, keep pushing forward, right? And that's something that college and our experiences throughout a high school and college uh, mold us to get there. And, and a lot of my uh, downtimes and times, my lows and instances where I've struggled, I felt like the greatest thing, I haven't shared this earlier, but PEDS, PEDS was one uh, part of my interest, but also the intersection between doing policy-wide efforts. Because I think, I think, when you're taking the time to not only work with patients one-on-one, -on -one, but the opportunity to make system-wide changes is something that I'm also interested in. So what drives me, even in my lowest times, when a certain class, anatomy, physiology, I forget what the exact uh, uh, bone of a brain is or whatnot, and I get frustrated, I get burnt out. What I have to tell myself is that I'm doing this for my kiddos that I'll be treating in the future, my future patients, uh, that I am a strong individual, competent individual that will add value in healthcare, just as everyone on this call is. You have to remind yourself, I think as help, you know, as aspiring students, some of the most competitive students, we often play ourselves short. Um, I think uh, Dr. Kelly alluded to some of the students, have more confidence and faith in yourself. So I think reminding ourselves of our vision, the big picture, the big picture, my big picture are my little kid patients that I'll get to treat and improve in their lives and make a difference in their lives. And that chance to make an impact, I know that if I accept defeat, I'll never have that chance. So I tell myself that, and that's what keeps me going to push past every single uh, obstacle that gets thrown my way. No, that, I mean, that was great, Tree. I mean, thanks for sharing. I mean, for me, when I think about what keeps me going, it's, it's, it's the people that, that motivate me and, and, and help me, have gotten me to where I am today, right? So for me, that's, uh, that's my family. That's those that have supported me along the way. Uh, I think about the sacrifices that those around me have made uh, for me, right? Um, both of my parents immigrated to the United States, I think now 22 years ago. Uh, my mother became a stay-at-home mom, uh, uh, you know, put aside her career for me. And so when I think of uh, those times when uh, things aren't going the way that I imagined or planned or thought of. 
when I think about those times that are challenging or, or are testing uh, of my, my, my future, uh, I think of uh, the past, actually. I think of those that have, have, have put aside and have made such sacrifices for me to do uh, what I'm doing currently. And I think for me, that's what keeps me going. It keeps me going because I realize uh, that I have, I have things to prove. I have things to keep moving forward. I have the skill set uh, and I have the opportunities to continue doing that. Um, and I think that mindset evolved a lot for me. Uh, I think recently, I hadn't always thought like that. It was always uh, puzzling to me sometimes, like, oh, how things aren't going too well. How do I fix this? Why, why is this happening? Uh, getting frustrated. Uh, I, I think that thinking about uh, those that have meant so much to me and that mean so much to me have keep, kept me centered uh, and, and really keep the goal or that value, as Sri mentioned, very upfront uh, and direct. Uh, and so that's what I think of when I think of those times that push me down or maybe challenge me. I think of the support system that I am so fortunate to have. I think about the opportunities that I am so thrilled to have. And I think about the impact that I am going to make with the support of those around me. I really love this question and I, I loved hearing Shri's and Karthik's answers. It's something that we haven't really talked about on the team before. So I think we should bring that back, you know, and really discuss a little bit because it's been heartwarming to hear their responses. Um, for me personally, what drives me, I think, would have to be my community that I come from. Um, like some of you potentially on this call, I come from a very small town in a very rural state, in a very rural part of the state. So it just gets smaller and smaller. And, you know, people who come out of my school don't go into the medical field. You know, it's very limited. It feels like your career options. And if I could see, you know, freshman me sitting down in a biology classroom thinking, why am I going to need this? All I can do is X, Y, and Z. And looking at me now being a biology major at college, all of those things are big deals in my community. And so I think about them and I think about the sacrifices they made and how proud they are of me doing this. And that's what really keeps me going. That's amazing. I mean, I guess to sum it up, that, that, that seems like our, our, at least between us three, the having tenacity paying respects to our past and those that have made sacrifices, the greats before us, we step on the shoulders of giants. That's how we advance in science. That's all science is. And paying tributes and respect to a community that we value and respect right now. I think that's, that's really important. And I think as future health professionals, those are three very important principles. So I'm, I'm, I'm excited to have had that talk with you. That was really, really cool. Um, but thank you all. I mean, this is amazing. We didn't even anticipate it to, for a discussion to continue on this long, but it's been a privilege to get to kind of uh, meet with some of you. Hopefully we'll all get to see each other at some conference, a state, regional, or even potentially our international conference. Uh, we understand uh, there may have been some questions that we were unable to address. If you still have any questions, you can reach out directly to us or directly to HOSA, which would be ideal. If you can email info at hosa.org, info at hosa.org. We can make sure that all of our, it's been, it's been dropped in the chat. Uh, any questions about HOSA and any ways to get involved and whatnot, feel free to reach out that way. We're always, uh, our personal emails, first name dot last name at hosa.org, as well as social media on Instagram and such. Uh, feel free to reach out. We're always here to support and uh, we're looking forward to a great year. So thank you all for joining us today. Have a wonderful day.